Good morning. Welcome to INSA's Coffee and Conversation with Rear Admiral Andrew Sugimoto. Before we begin, we'd like to share a video from our sponsor. We are GDIT, the thinkers, innovators, and mission experts supporting some of the most complex government, defense, and intelligence projects across the country, delivering the cloud, artificial intelligence, and cyber solutions that ensure today is secure and tomorrow is smarter, co-creating with more than 90 tech partners to move the mission forward. GDIT, delivering the art of the possible. Please welcome INSA Vice President for Policy, Larry Hanawa. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for Coffee and Conversation this morning. We're pleased to welcome one of our community's top leaders. Before we begin, let me make a few housekeeping notes. First, we hope to make this as interactive as possible, so please submit questions through the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. We have about 300 people registered for the event this morning, and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Second, we're pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today. So as a reminder, this program is on the record. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, GDIT, for their critical support of this program. We couldn't deliver this kind of thought leadership without the support of our partners. I'm pleased to welcome Catherine Murphy, Vice President for Cybersecurity, Preparedness, and Enforcement from GDIT, who will introduce this morning's speaker. Catherine, over to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Larry. <clears throat> I, I would like to uh, thank INSA for hosting this program. GDIT is a long-standing supporter of INSA, and we've been a trusted government partner for over 50 years. And this event complements our continued partnership and commitment to providing support to our customers' mission. At GDIT, we encourage innovation everywhere. It's core to our culture and the support we provide to our customers. And innovation and transformation is most certainly at the heart of the U.S. Coast Guard mission. Uh, while this year has brought its challenges, it's also created new opportunities and imperatives to transform the way we work today and tomorrow. And with that, it is my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Rear Admiral Andrew Sujimoto. He is the Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Intelligence. And in this capacity, he leads the efforts of more than 1,100 intelligence professionals who conduct the services intelligence program to include collection activities, analysis and production, geospatial intelligence, counterintelligence, cryptology, and critical IT and security functions. Previously, uh, Admiral Tsujimoto was uh, served as the chief of staff of the 8th Coast Guard District, overseeing operations spanning 26 states, including the Gulf coastline from Florida to Mexico, and the adjacent uh, offshore waters of the Gulf of Mexico. A graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in 1990, he went on to earn his JD from the University of San Diego School of Law in 2002. A very warm welcome, Admiral. Thank and you. over to you, Larry. Great, thank you, Catherine, and thank you again to GT for your support. Admiral, welcome this morning. We're, we're glad to have you here uh, for some early morning conversation. Thanks, it's great to be here today. And, and uh, I just wanted to thank INSA for all the great support um, that you guys provide us. Great, well, thanks. We, we really appreciate your engagement. Um, so let's get to a few questions this morning. Um, so uh, we'd like to hear first, um, for those who may not be as familiar with the Coast Guard's intelligence component, um, some of your core missions and activities. Uh, the Coast Guard is, is one of the smallest components of the intelligence community, um, but it has a, a wide range of missions. It has both intelligence and law enforcement authorities. So, so tell us what your core missions and priorities are and how you balance those uh, foreign intelligence and, and law enforcement uh, activities. Thanks, Larry. As, as you know, the Coast Guard's practice of intelligence is based on its unique role as a military service a law enforcement agency, a regulatory organization, a first responder, and a member of the intelligence community. And with those all come various different authorities. So with those unique authorities that really broad jurisdiction, flexible operational capabilities, maritime access, and expansive network of domestic and international partnerships, 
the Coast Guard directly contributes maritime access, emphasis, and expertise to the intelligence and law enforcement communities. Our national security and economic security depends on open trade, travel, and rules-based order, as you know. Um, and because of all those things, we are uniquely positioned to be in the right place. The maritime transportation system, which is that large interconnected uh, network of ports, waterways, rivers, the Great Lakes, all of which produce $5.4 trillion of our economic uh, power, about a quarter uh, to a third of our GDP, and it needs protecting. So our job is to continue to provide those indications and warning needed to secure the maritime transportation system and ensure the movement of commerce and the health of our economy. So the Coast Guard intelligence has generated and commenced execution of a plan to deliver actionable intelligence to our decision makers and support the prevention of any of the threats that would occur to it, including cyber threats. In 2020, for example, the Coast Guard Intelligence Network and its personnel at Coast Watch helped secure U.S. maritime borders by screening, vetting, and clearing more than 100,000 commercial vessels, more than 7 million crew members, more than 12 million illegal travelers, I'm sorry, legal travelers, and ensured the safe and secure transit throughout the entire maritime transportation system. We identified 6,700 travelers of concern and about 1,500 high interest vessels uh, suspected of, of various uh, um, crimes and 26 persons identified or known as suspected terrorists or other threats that came in the United States. So quite a bit expansive on, on what we do. Yeah, that's a wide ranging mission and some great metrics. Um, before we talk about the specific threats um, and some of the challenges that you just identified, um, I also want to get a, a little bit of a better uh, sense of your intelligence workforce. Um, the Coast Guard's intelligence specialty is relatively new. It, it, I think the first class of enlisted intelligence personnel started only in about 2008. Uh, or graduated from the, the, their training in 2008, um, and the cadre is relatively small. So how has the intelligence career path developed since 2008, um, and what does a career track in intelligence look like in the Coast Guard for enlisted and uh, officers, uh, and also for civilians? Um, first of all, we have an outstanding uh, force of about 1,300 individuals, and uh, it's had to quickly mature over the years. Um, to build and, and grow into the responsibilities that it has. We've rolled out career guides for officers, enlisted, civilian, and our reservists, and we continue to map out a viable path in intelligence, which is symbiotic with other uh, career paths in the Coast Guard. We do this on purpose so that they not only are able to provide um, detailed all source intelligence as necessary, but also that they continue to understand what the operators need in the field. And we do this both in a designated career path and as sort of a hybrid career path. As you were just saying, our enlisted members begin their indoctrination in Yorktown, Virginia for about a 12 week in-depth course. And after graduation, they can then move on to more advanced courses such as cryptology, language, cyber analyst training, uh, geospatial intelligence training, and they continue to grow their careers as they move on. The Coast Guard also offers enlisted personnel the opportunity to earn both a bachelor's or master's degrees in strategic intelligence. And then we can, they can do this both in a full-time or a part-time option. And it's the only program in the Coast Guard that funds an executive master's degree for our enlisted reserve reserve personnel. Our officers come from a multiple of different accession sources, and we have standardized that training pipeline for them as well. They come in, they do an eight-week intelligence officers course, and they're able to obtain fundamental training and indoctrination to be able to support whatever unit that they are doing. Great. Um, all right, so now that we've got an understanding of the missions and the personnel, now let's talk about um, how how the intelligence um, uh, staff deals with some of the threats that face the nation and that face the Coast Guard. So the most um, uh, prominent one, I guess, um, is uh, something that actually uh, we got a question about from Eric Schmidt of the New York Times. So we'll start with that. Um, Russia and China. How is the Coast Guard responding to acute competition with Russia and China? 
Um, this gets into questions about uh, Arctic operations and and Coast Guard operations out in the Pacific. So, you know, how what what are the Coast Guard's uh, uh, responses basically to the threats posed by Russia and China? So, first of all, as a member of the military service, our job is to protect uh, our domestic uh, nation intelligence. We're looking for foreign intelligence operations throughout. Uh, but there are other things that the Coast Guard does as a whole, and that is based about our law enforcement ability and the, the promotion of rules-based order on which uh, the, the world is based and society is based. And so things like illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, we continue to work with partner nations around the globe to make sure that those strategic protein resources for those nations are still there. In other places, we continue to promote the freedom of navigation at sea. We promote uh, safe and secure transportation of goods and services throughout the world. And we try to uh, ensure that other partners also participate and do uh, what they need to do to ensure the safety and security of international commerce wherever it is. Um, and I, I remember reading uh, in the media recently, maybe this was even Eric's article, I don't know, uh, about uh, Coast Guard deployments in Guam and, and further deployments out in the Pacific. Is there particular types of intelligence support um, that the intelligence apparatus is providing for those kinds of operations? There's a, a number of different things. One is we continue to help promote uh, the safety, security, the, the sovereignty of each of the island nations that are out there in terms of fisheries, uh, border protection, customs protection, and we work with them to help um, develop their own intrinsic capabilities. Uh, that's a big part is nation building as we go out in a number of different areas. And we are partnering throughout Oceania in a number of different ways to be able to do so. We're also looking for those illegal, unregulated, uh, unreported fishing fleets, the distant water fishing fleets that continue to go through those nations' EEZs and steal the, the, the fish, and we try to promote uh, a rules-based order based on that. Okay. Um, sticking, I guess, a little bit with Russia and China principally, um, I want to ask about counterintelligence uh, questions, because you also, you also oversee the Coast Guard's investigative service, uh, which has a counterintelligence mission. Um, and since you mentioned that the, the maritime transportation infrastructure is a significant national asset, uh, presumably a target for foreign intelligence collection. What are your principal counterintelligence concerns? So we know that our adversaries want to know how the United States is able to have such a powerful maritime transportation system. It is the, the, the backbone of our GDP. We have, uh, depending on how many coasts you count, at least uh, three coasts that are open year round to international trade. And as such, um, they want to understand how we go about uh, ensuring the safety, security of those ports, what our tactics and techniques are out there. And so we understand that there is a foreign intelligence element uh, very much concerned with how we do business, and we are looking for those individuals. Uh, we are also uh, wanting there for the force protection of our units, wherever they are in the globe, we're responsible for them. And so we will look for the threats that are posed to our units whether it's transnational criminal organizations or a foreign intelligence element. Okay. Um, now, narcotics is another threat that the Coast Guard's been dealing with for, for years, um, particularly in the waters around South and Central America. Can you discuss how the Coast Guard intelligence apparatus supports counter drug operations um, and how uh, it, it supports the Coast Guard's work to deal with some of the other transnational threats that you started to, to talk about? It's a great question. We take all sources of intelligence that are available to us, whether it's confidential informants or the use of geospatial intelligence, um, signals intelligence, any number, any of the ints that we can, and we feed them to the Joint Interagency Task Force uh, South that is uh, commanded by Rear Admiral Doug Fears. This is a perfect example of how we're able to bring both national and international partnerships together uh, and we then develop these things called uh, uh, movement alerts, uh, and we're looking for drug smugglers. And then uh, we place the, the steel on target, so to speak, and we go after them. And we partner both with uh, the U.S. Navy and the Canadians, the Brits, Dutch, um, and a number of Central American and Latin American country partners down there. It's an amazing operation. 
Yeah. Um, so on that, we have a question that came in from Charlie Allen, former Undersecretary for Intelligence at DHS, uh, who asked about the status of operations at the JIADF uh, in, uh, in, in Florida. Is it well staffed and does it have what it needs um, to support you in that counter narcotics mission? Well, sir, uh, it's great to hear from you again. Uh, you are one of the, the godfathers, so to speak, of intelligence. So it's always great to hear from you. Uh, you know, we can always use more resources. We can always use more steel on target. We can always use more aircraft in the air looking for the bad guys. Uh, but Admiral Fears is doing a fantastic job along with the U.S. Southern Command down there hunting down uh, the transnational criminal organizations as they try to move both uh, human smuggling, drug smuggling, and other things throughout the, the Eastern Pacific and the Caribbean. And he's doing a masterful job of coordinating our efforts. Great. Um, I also want to ask about um, uh, some challenges that the Coast Guard, as well as the other military services, um, uh, is facing. Um, domestic extremism uh, and insider threats. So uh, the Coast Guard, as with the other services, I gather, is reviewing the extent of anti-government extremism in its ranks. Um, you have a head start on this effort, I guess, because the Coast Guard has a very robust insider threat program that in many ways is a model um, for other agencies in the IC. Um, to, to look for counterintelligence and security threats from within. So I guess I have a two-part question. Uh, first, what's the Coast Guard doing regards to anti-government extremism in the ranks? Um, and then second, relatedly, what kinds of best practices have you found from your insider threat program um, that you've adopted um, to deal with both extremist, uh, excuse me, adapted to deal with both extremist and counterintelligence threats? Thanks. Um, you know, we're a microcosm of society, so we need to be well aware that uh, not only is there a balance between First Amendment rights, but then when you take it too far, that goes to extremism. So we're conducting uh, a Coast Guard-wide training specifically on where that line is, what you can do. Um, it's okay to have political thoughts, but not to, to take it too, too far. And so, one, we're educating the populace on exactly what where that line is and to help prevent things uh, where uh, we would have, let's say, um, an internal cancer, so to speak, growing on it. And we really want to ensure that uh, the sanctity is protected. So that's the first part. The second part is we do have a great insider threat program, which I'm really proud of. This is an ongoing operation that is world class. And unfortunately, the Coast Guard has experienced uh, uh, insider threats before. About a year ago, two years ago, we arrested somebody named Christopher Hassan who had uh, intended to conduct uh, harm to others, and we were able to detect him and do so. And the way we do that is, is not only do we have monitoring systems that, that indicate uh, whether or not somebody is going to go too far, but we have a great uh, internal task force that we work with, the Coast Guard Investigative Service, uh, the lawyers and others, so that we balance individuals' rights of expression and, and uh, political thought and others, which is what we're here to, to defend, the Constitution, but also to ensure that it doesn't go too far and someone is then most likely going to get hurt. Right. Okay. Um, I also want to touch on one other um, capability, cyber. Um, and uh, ask you how the Coast Guard addresses cyber threats to its infrastructure and operations, uh, and how you collaborate with um, with the intelligence community, with DOD, with DHS, um, and other government agencies to defend against cyber attacks. The Coast Guard aligns with the DHS' cybersecurity strategy implementation plan, and some of the examples include maintaining strategic awareness of national and systemic cybersecurity risks, as you know, it's sort of a balance. It's both nation state as well as uh, criminal organizations uh, trying to get money afterwards. They develop and maintain tools and services in response to those uh, ID and emerging threats. And then we also work with our partners, not only in the federal government like CISA, but also in the maritime industry. And we work with them deliberately so that there is a clear communication paths, there's established trust, and that we can help each other identify where those threats are coming from. As the sector-specific agency for the maritime transportation, the Coast Guard is leading the nation's defense in the protection of the maritime critical infrastructure. Um, and they've created a cyber protection team that offers cybersecurity services to the MTS. The CPT consists of three teams of active duty cybersecurity professionals who are trained and certified 
in delivering our core CPT services, which are to assess the system, hunt for the, the, the malware or the bad guys, clear it out of our system, and then in turn harden it so they can't come back in again. And the CPT's mission is to enhance resiliency overall of not only Coast Guard systems, but also the MTS. Okay. Um, and a related question related to cybersecurity, but also some workforce issues. We have a question from Mark Williams of VMware, who asked about the extent to which the Coast Guard and the intelligence component in particular uh, has adopted secure telework, um, or maybe telework in general, um, particularly during the, the last 12 months of the pandemic. So the, the Coast Guard's done an absolute fantastic job. They've um, rolled out somewhere close to six 16,000 uh, individual workstations to be able, for people to be able to telework. Uh, they are rolling out uh, uh, iPad systems for our marine inspectors, so there's a secure way for them to to be able to inspect our ships. And and uh, and not only that, but take the advantage of technology to make their work easier, more efficient, and better. And the same thing goes for uh, our pilots in the cockpit having an electronic flight bag with them so they have all the tools necessary instead of carrying uh, numerous volumes of regulations or, or maps or all the other different things. And then as we're doing here, the ability to virtually communicate across a number of, of different uh, conferences, it's reduced some things like travel costs, other things like that, yet we're still able to, to meet, collaborate, and continue to move on the Coast Guard strategic goals. Okay. Great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about intelligence support to operations, and I'm going to start this line of questioning uh, with a question we got from uh, one of our listeners, Bob Ashley, uh, former director of DIA, um, who asks uh, how you uh, use ISR assets and unmanned vehicles to monitor maritime domains and team with partner nations. Sir, it's great to hear from you again. Uh, uh, we First of all, our national security cutters are equipped with uh, the Scan Eagle drone system, which is a fantastic way to put up uh, persistent ISR and, and not necessarily have to put flight hours on our aircraft and to be able to scan for the bad guys. We also uh, have our aircraft are equipped with the Minotaur Family of Systems uh, ISR capability, which we also are then bringing in. And the Coast Guard has developed a uh, the ability to um, bring in ISR data and put it into a data lake. And so we're at the very nascent stages of this, but we're really looking forward to the ability to process, um, exploit, and then disseminate the, the data that we get off of the, the ISR aircraft. Uh, we are looking at other uh, unmanned systems, whether it's on the surface or others, to provide that persistent stare necessary to help continue to build out a better maritime domain awareness out there to see where the threats are coming from. And just to pull that thread a little bit more, are you integrated with naval intelligence as well on uh, to share the take, for example, from ISR assets or, or otherwise share information that, that provides maritime domain awareness? Yeah, actually, I forgot to mention that part. Thanks for bringing that up. The Navy is also has the Minotaur system. And so we are able to share with them targeting data and maritime domain awareness but then also Customs and Border Protection inside the Department of Homeland Security is also uh, equipping their aircraft with Minotaur. And so we are in that unique position actually in the middle to be able to share data in both directions, both to CBP as we continue to partner together to hunt uh, drug smugglers and also national defense and, and other missions with the Navy on the other side. It's a great place to be right now. That sounds though like it's also a challenge because it, that's a great example of how the Coast Guard is sort of splitting its foreign intelligence uh, missions and authorities in working with the Navy, but also its law enforcement missions and authorities in working with CBP. You know, that's absolutely correct. And we have to be very careful of how and who in our intelligence enterprise conducts those various missions. Obviously our national intelligence requires specific oversight as mandated by law in this particular billets. And then there are a number of our in, uh, intel specialists that are conducting law enforcement intelligence out there that also uh, need to stay within their lanes to be able to make sure that the end game, which is prosecution of the bad guys in, in federal court, is able to be done so uh, without compromising the intelligence paths that, that right. go both ways. 
Right, that's a tough needle to thread, but so far so good. Um, so getting back to the operational questions. So I wanted to talk about um, uh, intelligence support to operations in the Arctic. Um, the Coast Guard has the leading role really on security in the Arctic, um, which is becoming increasingly tense as Russia, China, and other countries seek to take advantage of the, the shipping lanes opened by the, the melting sea ice. So what role does Coast Guard intelligence play in supporting Arctic security strategy and operations, um, and also in understanding the impact of climate change on the Arctic? That's exactly right. Uh, well, first of all, the increased traffic means there's increased possibility of search and rescue and increased possibility of environmental damage. Uh, there's also the change in climate and understanding how that's going to impact where we need to place resources, as well as our adversaries where they're going to want to place resources to be able to protect their interest in the Arctic. So we're really proud of the polar security cutters that are going to come online and be able to provide persistent um, domain awareness in the high latitudes, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and okay. to be able to provide that uh, persistent stare, so to speak, in the area and be able to not only ensure and keep tabs on what our adversaries are doing, but more importantly, to be there, have a deeper understanding of those other existential threats that we were just talking about, whether right. it's search and rescue, whether it's climate change, or whether it's uh, environmental impacts. Right. Um, and on this topic, we have a question from Joe Walsh of Maxar, um, who asks how the Coast Guard's thinking about collaboration across services, combatant commands, inter international partners, and industry to enhance situational awareness in the Arctic. So how do you work with the other partners out there um, to better understand the domain? So across the government, uh, we are working in a number of different areas to be able to try and get that understanding of what uh, vessel traffic looks like in, in the Arctic. We're also working internationally. Uh, we're trying to set up an international uh, shipping um, paradigm, sort of like a, a, a vessel traffic system or, or a, at least a scheme of maneuver for vessels in the Bering Strait as they head up to the northern sea route or, or across uh, the northern part of Alaska. And we're also doing this uh, ensuring the protection so that there is some ability to provide environmental response uh, for, for search and rescue as is necessary to do so. We The, the Coast Guard obviously can't do it by itself. We are right. one of the smaller agencies. We have to do this with our partnerships. And we're really proud of, of working together with a number of different agencies uh, to be able to do so. Right, good, okay. Um, now, I'd also like to talk about the, the kinds of intelligence activities that you undertake in order to support all of these different deployments and all these different missions. Um, and so let's start with open source intelligence, which is um, which is a growing area of interest. Um, also the subject of an INSA, um, uh, INSA Spring Symposium on April 7th and 8th, so we'll look for information on that. Um, but since the Coast Guard shares intelligence across the government, as you mentioned, um, and with international partners and industry, it makes extensive use of open source data like commercial satellite imagery, AIS data, and, and all sorts of publicly available information. Um, so how does the Coast Guard draw on this publicly available information, um, and how do you then fuse it with uh, threat intelligence and classified information as needed to, to generate the insights that you need to support operations and policy decisions? It's a great question. And as you know, this is one of those emerging fields. First, to be really clear, we stay very much within uh, existing uh, TTP that we've established, tactics, techniques, and procedures that we've established to make sure that we are in alignment with oversight or the ability to conduct a, a law enforcement, a prosecute a law enforcement case. Okay. So the Coast Guard uses publicly available information gleaned from crowdsourcing and social media and operational decision making. Along with greater intelligence community efforts, we engage in overt OSIN collection and analysis with the use of advanced digital technologies and methods, including social media aggregators and other off-the-shelf uh, software. We do this by looking for particular threatening language or imagery. We translate sometimes from foreign uh, language, uh, and we do these all these things in a particular, uh, let's say, in a, in a sector to be able to look for the threats that, that may be posed there. It could be a law enforcement case situation whereby somebody is doing illegal charters or it could be a foreign intelligence uh, enterprise trying to do something. So 
those are the different ways that we kind of combine it. And then uh, it goes in with our all source analysts to pull in whatever other data they can from the different feeds. And depending on how and what we are doing, uh, obviously the number one mission being force protection for uh, and the safety of our personnel and all those operating inside the maritime transportation system, mm -hmm. we will do what we need to do to, to be able to then share that imagery or um, the social the data that we got from OSINT to the particular um, sector commander to ensure that they have the latest information and intelligence necessary to optimize their decision. Yeah. How important in that whole mix of information is commercial um, geoint and particularly satellite imagery, but also all the other data you get from geoint providers? Because the certainly the the landscape has changed over the last decade or so, right? The U.S. government no longer has a a monopoly on advanced um, space assets, and now we've got companies that are doing all sorts of great um, data collection with their own satellite constellations. So, so what role does does commercial geoint play in that mix? It's actually open doors for us, right? It was always yeah. very difficult to be able to share, share geospatial intelligence with the partners, uh, even inside the, the federal government, but also more importantly, internationally. And so as I was talking about uh, previously with going after those distant water fishing fleets that are going, uh, let's say, uh, attacking the strategic protein stock of a, of a coastal nation, we're able to then take commercially available geospatial intelligence provide them a domain awareness of what's going on in their particular waters, the patterns of light, what they're doing, and then share that with them at the unclass level. And so U.S. Southern Command is leading a great example of this, partnering with Florida International University, uh, providing Central and South America with a common operating picture so they can identify where those uh, illegal, unregulated, unreporting fishing fleets are. And they're huh. doing so through the use of commercial uh, synthetic aperture radar, commercial ge geospatial intelligence. It's just an amazing product. Yeah, that's a great asset to have. So, um, but now you've got all this, these different sources of data. Um, as you mentioned, you've got to keep data separate depending on whether you're using it for foreign intelligence or law enforcement purposes. Um, so that seems like it would create real challenges in, in not only collecting, but also compiling, storing, and, and sharing the information. So what are the, the challenges you face regarding data acquisition, organization, and management? Um, and then how do you use tools like artificial intelligence to, to, to analyze that information effectively um, and, and make effective use of it wherever it came from? Wow, it is two questions. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the problem is, is you know, a lot of what we do, it's all based in data. Most of ISR becomes a data problem, right? And so, right. a lot of intelligence feeds, wherever they come from, it ends up and resides as data. And so, the ability to share that is the key piece to enabling partnerships. And as a, a member of DHS, we sort of pride ourselves on on the fact that we work across 22 separate agencies the protection of the homeland just inside our own department. Uh, but then internationally, uh, at the state and local levels, the effectiveness of us coming together as a team is all based on the ability to share that unclassified data. And right. as you know, even unclassed data, maybe even sharing of unclassed data sometimes is harder than sharing at secret or the, the top secret level. And the ability to, to do so and transfer it are those key areas that we're working on. Right. What I am proud to say is that uh, our team has built a data lake and the ability to, to move data and analyze it at the unclass level, uh, secret level, and, and the top secret level. So we are building into that space. We are working with partners over at the Pentagon and the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center and others to really provide and get after algorithms, artificial intelligence, and any other tools available to crunch the data. And then we're, you know, to ensure that if it's a law enforcement side of the house that we're able to provide the government, you know, whatever the government needs to provide to the defense in terms of doing so without compromising or taking anything away from the classified systems and then protecting classified means and, and sources on the other side as well, too. It's a balance that we strike, but it's one of those things that we have to um, very specifically target. And it's a uh, it's a data problem that is, if anyone out there has a solution, I'd love to see, <laughs> love to be able to have the answer to get after it, because I will tell you, we're not the only ones, but we're uh, we're definitely trying and moving out on that. 
The Coast Guard itself has also created a data readiness task force. And as we modernize throughout their systems, even non-intelligence systems, as you know, everything is, is often based on, on data, um, even logistics. And we are um, managing that throughout the organization and moving forward in that in that area. Okay, great. Yeah, no, the challenges of managing data nowadays is is overwhelming, but it sounds like you're 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 attacking it um, in a sensible way. Um, I also want to ask about one other intelligence uh, discipline, uh, humans. Not many people are aware that the Coast Guard actually has a human capability. Um, in fact, when I worked on the House Intelligence Committee years ago uh, and oversaw human activities across the IC, uh, I oversaw the defense attache system, which is where uh, the Coast Guard has, um, has attaches. Um, they serve in a dozen or so locations around the world, um, and they bring significant expertise expertise to bear in countries whose navies are really more aligned in both mission and in size with the U.S. Coast Guard. So talk a little bit about the Coast Guard Attaché Program and how it contributes to the defense intelligence enterprise, um, and also more broadly, how it supports U.S. defense policy on issues around the world like China, the Arctic, counter-narcotics, and some of the other threats we've talked about. Um, our uh... Coast Guard Attaché Program or COGAT program is actually now in 19 countries. 19. Um, and as you were just describing, we're a little bit different from our DOD counterparts and our missions and authorities. We still do everything that they do in particular regard, but we have this unique perspective in that we bring law enforcement, the, the protection of our ports and, and waterways, uh, and they serve as a part of the embassy staff. Um, right to push forward those diplomatic missions. They represent the Commandant, uh, the Coast Guard, Secretary of Defense, uh, the Joint Chiefs, and they serve as military advisors in that unique capacity in some ways, also a little bit of the law enforcement DHS representatives wherever they are. And so um, some of those things could be uh, theater security cooperation programs, which we have uh, established in several nations in which we're helping them build up their capabilities. But it also could be reporting on in-country and regional political and military activities um, as part of the official staff. And so they do quite a bit for us uh, in a number of different areas around the world. Great. Well, I'd always thought they did some terrific work and, and really occupied a niche capability. So uh, glad to hear they're in more countries than, than when I last um, worked with them, because I think it's a great program. Um, let me turn to a few uh, additional audience uh, questions, because we're getting a number of questions touching on a bunch of different issues that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so one question we have um, from Anthony Del Vecchio at Booz Allen. Uh, do you have a vision for more closely linking intelligence with acquisition? to combat emerging cybersecurity and supply chain threats? Absolutely. So um, protecting the supply chain is that next key piece that we really need to get after. Um, we have, you know, the last 19 years, we've been concentrating on a, an opponent that ne not necessarily into our supply chain. And we know for a fact that our adversaries at this point are very interested in how, what, and why we do things in terms of acquisitions, the intellectual property portions of it, as well as the ability to produce, deploy, and all the other facets of those things. So the counterintelligence service, as we were just talking about before, one of their core missions as well is protecting uh, uh, the supply chain and ensuring that that, that is part of um, the secure posture that we provide for them. And we identify what those threats are and then mitigate those threats in a number of different ways. Cyber, um, in, in the acquisitions world, um, the other part of that too is we need to be agile enough to continue to um, acquire the technology and tools necessary that allow us to stay with technology and our adversaries wherever we are in the world. We can't do that, though, without compromising the risk. And so there's a balance there as we move forward that we really need to concentrate on and make sure that we get right. Okay. And in a related question, we have a question from Ara Susadelis, who asks how um, the Coast Guard equips um, the intelligence component. Do, do you have, does the Coast Guard have independent procurement authority across all missions, or is the primary budget authority stem from just a, a single source? So how do you actually get the, how do you actually acquire then the items that you need? 
So we have a couple of different vehicles that we can use. Uh, we can use the normal uh, Coast Guard budgeting process. Um, we also can go through the department and there are a couple of, of um, things like the open source intelligence tools. We use that we go through the department and, and, and work together on that. They have a, a strategic procurement source. So uh, we're able to use GSA and other things like that to, to, to get after um, that problem set. The other piece is um, we have the capability, if we need to, to procure things through the Director of National Intelligence, the, D, the DNI process as well, too. Right. Okay. Um, we have a, a question um, from Oriana Scher and, uh, from the Navy, who asks about the intelligence opportunities that derive from the tri-service maritime strategy. So maybe if you can discuss a little bit what that strategy is and then what the intelligence opportunities are that, that derive from it. The tri-service maritime strategy is a strategy signed by all three service chiefs in which we, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Navy are all coming together to align our interests in, in going after our near-peer adversaries and the defense of the nation. Um, we want to ensure things like command and control, the, the transferring of, of uh, ISR data, all those things are on a system that can talk to each other, that it's interoperable, and that as we move forward in the information warfare age, which is where we are at this particular point, we do so in a cohesive, strategic, and aligned manner across the, across the board. And so um, while the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy as a larger entity covers a number of other different warfighting principles, uh, intelligence specifically is embedded in in that information warfare piece and and aligning ourselves across all three and we have as a matter of fact I just uh, attended a work group yesterday with the Marine Corps and the Navy in which we are developing the implementation plan and, and moving out and so we're pretty proud of that and we are uh, very much engaged in, and and uh, participating in, in the build out of it Okay, um, and we have a question about your R&D priorities. Christopher Verlinden asked, what are the Coast Guard's biggest R&D priorities right now, particularly in the intelligence domain, and how can small technology companies support the Coast Guard more effectively? Um, if you've got a solution for crunching ISR data, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, it's, a, it's a great way to do that. Um, you know, in being innovative, um, Understanding that we are an organization that does not have a mammoth budget that we operate on, uh, we are one of the most efficient government agencies out there. And so when we do choose to spend money, we'd like to use technology that is innovative, it's efficient uh, and, and gets the job done. Those are the things that we're looking for uh, as we move out in this new world. And obviously it needs to be secure, a number of different factors that are all part of it. Um, we value um, that special nature of it wherever you are. If it's a large country, small, uh, small company, large, small company, and of course, uh, we'll follow all the acquisition rules to do so. Where we are in R&D, um, there's a number of different things like um, uh, unmanned systems, the ability to use uh, remote sensing and ISR to be able to uh, take data, the data transport piece from ISR platforms to uh, the data lakes where we can then crunch it using artificial intelligence or any other algorithms that they may be able to come up with. Those are all part of what we are um, absolutely looking for innovative solutions to. Well, those are a lot of areas where industry can hopefully be of help to you. So you may you may end up getting some um, some proposals out of this discussion this morning. So if that helps, that's terrific. Um, let me ask one last question as we're coming to the end of our time. Um, if you had a, a marginal dollar or a marginal billet to allocate um, to uh, to some particular function, whether to enhance an existing capability or, or acquire a new one, um, where where would you put those those additional resources? Um, wow, just one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, uh, an amount. Let's say if you, if you had a pile of additional resources, people and money, uh, where where would you allocate them? Um, obviously, uh, we do this all because we have fantastic individuals. So if I had um, some money, I would continue to invest in the training of our individuals. Uh, the more we invest in them, the better we're able to going to be able to retain the talent. And so that's part of one of it. Two. 
uh, we need to provide them the best possible tools that are out there. And so things like artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, the data lakes that are necessary for them to be able to operate and, and move efficiently in this new world of information is, the, is, a, is another place where we do it. And then the protection of everything through cyber is, is another. So and having an understanding of intelligence in that particular area so that we can help uh, Admiral Mike Ryan, who commands the Coast Guard Cyber Forces, uh, to do those things that we were talking about before are, are key. Those are where we probably would invest it. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll get a pile of marginal dollars to take care of, <laughs> of all those tasks. Um, as we wrap up, um, any last thoughts, any any last um, messages you want to convey? No, I, you know, I just wanted to, to thank INSA. Uh, about three months ago, you guys recognized one of the, the Coast Guard's uh, program managers for her exceptional work in leading one of our uh, intelligence uh, fields. Um, it's one of those little things that particularly in a COVID environment and, and talks like these that continue to have us connected. The only way that we survive and we move forward is, is that communications that INSA provides in a number of different ways. And so I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the audience today. The questions were fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be part of uh, the, the coffee and, and conversation this morning. Great. Well, thank you. It's been terrific um, having you here. And thanks for your candor um, and sharing your insights with us um, this morning. We really appreciate it. So once again, thanks also to GDIT for supporting this program. Um, let me just look ahead uh, to a few additional INSA events we, we have on the horizon. Uh, we close out March programming next week when Laura Shaw, Chief Operating Officer for the ODNI, joins us for a Wednesday Wisdom uh, on March 24th. Then moving into April, um, as I had alluded to earlier, our virtual spring symposium uh, on open source, OSINT, Thinking Outside the SCIF, will be held on April 7th and 8th from 2 to 4 p.m. on each afternoon. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Please register online. Each day we'll kick off with a keynote uh, followed by a panel discussion. We have a great lineup of speakers ready to discuss both uh, the policy and cultural changes needed to effectively use OSINT, as well as uh, spotlight some of the emerging technologies that are helping analysts find that proverbial needle in the haystack. Then after that, in recognition of Supply Chain Integrity Month, we will hold an April 20 discussion on securing microelectronic supply chains. The acting director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, Mike Orlando, will deliver keynote remarks on uh, supply chain threats facing the nation, uh, and he'll be followed by a panel discussion focused specifically on the microelectronic supply chain challenges. Then tomorrow, uh, we will open registration for our April 26th Leadership Luncheon with NGA Director Admiral Sharp. So please save the date and keep an eye on our website for more event details. And finally, two weeks remain for 8A businesses to apply to participate in our June 8th and 9th Virtual 8A National Security Showcase. This event is an excellent opportunity for 8A businesses to market their innovative national security technologies, applications, and services to venture capitalists, procurement representatives from prime contractors, and the 18 IC agencies. So any 8A business with innovative national security products or services uh, is invited to apply to participate. The submission deadline is Wednesday, March 31st, so about two weeks remaining. As always, visit insaonline.org for full details of all these events and to keep current on INSA news and programs. When the webinar ends, you'll see a short survey that pops up. Please take a few moments to complete it and let us know how we did. This concludes today's program. Stay safe and healthy and have a great day.